We are so delighted that today we get to have uh, the playwright here with us, Amy Herzog, is here to join us. Uh, and she'll be out in just, just a minute. But uh, to introduce her, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background. I know there's a bio in your program. Um, but she uh, has been to Yale twice, so she's very, very familiar with, uh, with New Haven. She got both her undergraduate degree and her graduate degree in playwriting from Yale. Um, and she uh, she really did write across the country. So there are pieces of truth in this play. She rode from New Haven uh, to San Francisco with Habitat for Humanity. Um, and some of you may may have seen her play Belleville at Yale a little while ago in 2011. Uh, and another play of hers, After the Revolution, uh, is actually uh, very related to this play. Vera shows up in this play. It's a part. Uh, it's a part of a trilogy. Um, so it's all. It's all tied together. And I just want to um, take a second also to thank Connecticut Humanities, uh, who have so generously sponsored our <coughs> symposium here at Longmark Theater. Uh, and I'm curious, how many of you have been to a symposium, symposium before? I see a show of hands, I'm curious. Oh, wonderful. So many of you, many of you are familiar with the program. So we bring in uh, experts or uh, playwrights or artists uh, to have a chance to really dive in and talk about the play. So, and we've lost sound, perhaps. <laughs> we have some technical difficulties, so hold on for one second and, uh, and Amy will be out in just a moment. Are we good? Switch mics. How's this? Is this better? Yeah. Is this, this one's dead? We'll get another mic and share between us. All right, and without further ado, welcome to the playwright Amy Herzog. post-blacklist play or political play. Um, and after writing it, I felt that I wasn't completely done with this character, Vera. I had created, but that's not really the right word, because she's based so directly on my grandmother, and I wanted sort of some more time with her. Um, so this play um, came into being after a very beloved cousin of mine um, lost a friend in a rafting accident. And um, I was very moved by his grief and his youth and his struggle to deal with the, um, such a huge loss at such a young age. And somehow those two things um, found their way together into this play. Wonderful. Um, and could you talk a little bit about, is there, is there a set of films? Um, <laughs> uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the relationship, sort of um, dive into the relationship between After the Revolution and this play, and potentially maybe what's coming next? Right. Um, well, After the Revolution, um, is about a, a woman of my generation who's dealing with her grandparents' legacy uh, as part of the American left. So my, my grandfather, Joe Joseph, who's referred to in this play, was a very ardent communist, and he, uh, he was blacklisted, and uh, his political career was ruined when he was quite young. He was in his, I guess, late 30s, during the blacklist, or early 40s. Um, I learned in the 90s that actually he had, in fact, been a spy for the Soviet Union. Um, and so the blacklist, while a horrible miscarriage of justice and a case of um, 
persecution was, in his case, somewhat ambiguous. So um, as my family was kind of dealing with that revelation that became public, um, I became interested in, in what that legacy meant um, and in the question of disappointments, uh, both in sort of large political movements and disappointments within families. And what's next is a third play that I don't know well enough to talk about yet, but I think there's one more play in the series. Amazing, thank you. And uh, Zoan and Micah, thank you for joining us. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit from both of you about uh, about your experience working through this play with something that's come from a very personal place and what uh, and what it was for you uh, in your journey rehearsing this play um, and from your perspectives. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, when I was uh, first offered this role, I, I accepted right away, of course, and then I panicked because I don't usually play things uh, that are this big. I'm, I'm a supporting actress, and I was just completely baffled by why they would choose me. I had done several plays for Gordon Edelstein, and uh, so he used to be in Seattle, where I am from, and so uh, that was our connection. And fortunately, Eric Team, our director, had many talk sessions with us. That first week, we were just really getting to know each other. A lot of directors put you on your feet immediately, and they have things blocked out, but they, they want you to go down left when you say yada yada, and then they want you to pick up a book and walk you know, it's very precise, but this wasn't the case at all because this is such a new form of a play. It's just, um, it doesn't go like act one, act two, then solve everything in act three. <laughs> so uh, we, it was just a joy. We learned so much about each other and about the period of play, about Mr. Herzog and about uh, Vera and what's his name? <laughs> And uh, it was uh, a joy to work through. And I don't know that I can say anything more than that, except that we hope that that joy comes out in our performances. Hi. Uh, so I sort of uh, voraciously pursued doing this play uh, once I first discovered it. Uh, there were some sort of like haunting similarities for, from my personal background, and I thought, you know, I have to do this before I get too old. Um, I never really felt that way about, you know, Shakespeare or uh, Chekhov, but I thought, you know, this play I can do before. Uh, I'm too old to play it. And um, so I'm so glad. I, I will, you know, full disclosure audition for many productions of it. Uh, before I did uh, get it, and I'm so glad, you know, I don't believe in that things happen for a reason, but I'm so glad that it was here, um, and I'm so glad it's with these people that we got to do Amy's beautiful play. Um, so it, it felt right, and it was sort of a, coming from a leftist, you know, background with family all over, and, you know, having previously smoked a lot of pot. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the only, the most important similarity, but uh, <laughs> you know, I'm so, I'm so overjoyed to be doing this. Um, I'm curious also, uh, just to go backwards a little bit, um, to talk about how you came to playwriting, because I know you've, you've been a performer as well, and sort of the relationship between uh, pursuing performance and then uh, coming into writing. Sure, um, and my performing days are pretty far in the past now, but I went to school here in New Haven twice. I went to undergrad and graduate school here at Yale, and actually I did a cross-country cycling tri trip that started in New Haven, so I dipped my back tires in the Atlantic right well, you know, in the sound, right here, um, before starting off on a cross-country bike trip. Um, I was an actor first, like a lot of playwrights. Um, I think a lot of um, people who are, are in the theater start out acting and it just takes a little while to find your right place and to acknowledge to yourself that you don't have the tremendous gift of holding an audience um, and finding new subtleties in every performance every night, which I found very challenging when I was acting. So I did get one professional acting gig out of college. I'm traveling in a children's theater company tour of 
Ramona Quimby, the, the children's book adaptation of that book. And uh, after five months of that, I was really despondent um, and lost. And I sat down on the floor of a laundromat where I was doing the whole company's laundry. It was my day or whatever. Um, and I wrote this 10 or 15 minute play. And I just, uh, it wasn't good, but I had this feeling as I was writing it that something was starting to make sense. So over the next few years, I took a couple of playwriting classes. I applied to graduate school. Um, and that was, so now it's um, sort of 12 or 13 years later. Amazing. I mean, have, I'm curious, have either of you uh, ventured into areas of the theater other than performing in your careers? Um, yes, as a matter of fact, I won a playwriting contest. <laughs> <laughs> and my play was produced at uh, the Key West Theater Festival. Full production, and it's not an easy one because I adapted it from a wonderful book called Gigi the Merry-Go-Round Horse. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's a fun play, but I dipped into it. Ever. I, I have tried to write other plays, and that was apparently <coughs> my moment of brilliance. <laughs> my, my answer is no. <laughs> and I was a dancer when I was young, thanks to my mother. <laughs> Great. Well, I would love to um, open it up to questions um, in the audience. And Katrina here has a microphone so that everyone can be heard. So if you have a question, raise your hand and she'll, and she'll come find you. There's one right behind you. I, I perhaps can speak loud enough without a mic. Good old. Um, uh, 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 wait, I think we're, we're actually, uh, for, for the sake of recording, it would be very helpful. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about the significance of the title because obviously it had different nuances. And did you choose the title or was it chosen for you, et cetera? Thank you. Um, I did choose the title and I always feel like I, I get asked this often and my answer is kind of um, like anticlimactic because I have a really hard time writing titles. So for me it came down to, I wrote down like 20 possibilities and kind of like sent them to my friends. and. So, so I, I, I think a lot of lyrics begin with a title and have these brilliant reasons for titles. Um, for me, I, um, as I got better at writing, I got worse at titles, which I think is a, a really good thing because I think uh, the ability to title is its own thing and it, it can be a kind of a narrow or glib approach. So anyway, so for me it's important, but I don't know the title until the very end. But if I were um, now, in retrospect, to pretend it was this really intentional act and that I had really good reasons for it, I would say, that um, you know, this play is really about distances and their distances of time and of space and distances between people. Um, and I, and uh, the whole place takes place in this tiny. The whole play takes place in a tiny apartment. But um, I, always, I felt that there should be some kind of feeling of expanse beyond the apartment. Great, thank you. Other questions? There's one, a couple in the middle. Thanks, Katrina. <laughs> 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 I have a question. I once heard a talk by Mark Lemos, the director, and he said when he directs a play after the play is done, the play may be different than what he intended. It has a different meaning because the actors bring in their interpretation after he leaves, so to speak. And I was wondering, as a playwright, do you find sometimes that the actors provide a meaning to the play that maybe you didn't even see, or a different meaning than you intended, or, or is the meaning always exactly what... In other words, when you write something, uh, that's language, but also there are people interpreting it, maybe people say it or interpreting it, I mean, the actors are interpreting it. Does the play, sometimes when you see production, is, does it have a different meaning than maybe what you intended? I mean, not the whole thing, but maybe parts of it. Exactly. So never the whole thing. I've never had that experience of walking into a theater and feeling like someone had made my play about 19th century Russia or something. I've never <laughs> had that experience of a really radical interpretation. But, but the smaller thing that you just said happens constantly. It happened a million times tonight, and it's a wonderful thing. If, if there's a certain kind of cohesion, if there's a certain way that the company and the production understand like the, the overall justice of the work, then within that there are just millions of colors and variations. So this afternoon it was incredible to hear certain lines. There were, there were even certain times where one of the actors would pause at a place that I hadn't quite thought of it and I, I, real, I felt this swelling of realization of what that was going to do to the next line and then there'd be like a beautiful laugh that I had never heard before. Or, so it happens constantly, and I think a mistake that playwrights can make, especially early career playwrights, is to be uh, very kind of orthodox 
about what everything should sound like and what everything should be like. And if people feel a kind of freedom to, you know, within the map you've built, to, to be artists, to create things themselves, then you wind up with a much richer, more satisfying collection. But I'd love to hear what you guys feel about that. I mean, do you, do you feel a certain, do, when you read a script, are you like, this is what this is supposed to be? Is it more of a process of exploration? I think it's a, a process of exploration. And um, when you do the same play at another theater with a different cast, that's an eye-opener, too, because no two actors interpret things the same way. So that it's all a matter of, uh, I guess, growth is the, uh, is the operative word. It's, it's working with the author, in the playwright, in absentia, and still trying to understand what she was trying to get across with the people you're working with, and of course, a different director for any production. Um, I didn't see the production before in New York when I got it, and perhaps you can speak to that. But, oops, do we need to switch out my signal? Oh, yeah, I think it's good. Maybe. This I side works. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, I always find that when I read a script and I like, then we start rehearsal, and I think I know everything, and then I know what it, what what this is about. Those are always the moments that I get there and, and you know throw me for a loop. The minute you really start to explore it, and more often than not, those first impulses, you know, maybe wrong is too too strong a word, but not helpful because um, it's like you're painting something onto it. And I think, uh, especially with a, a play like Amy's, that's so rhythmic and. Um, and relax that you have to approach it with a relaxation to, and it sort of just like takes you where you need to go. I think good writing does that. It's sort of like you speak the words and you breathe and it sort of does the play for you. Well, my question has to do with the end of the play and I wondered if when you wrote it you knew what the ending was going to be or whether you didn't, and whether you had contemplated a variety of endings. I did not know what the ending was going to be. I think I had an emotional sense of what the ending was going to be, that Leah was going to move on, and that it was going to be both sad for them and sort of, you know, what must happen, an important moment of growth for him. The realization of, of Ginny's role, uh, you know, the Across the Hall Neighbor, I did not realize at all until I was there. And I, I had been writing my grandmother out an across the hall neighbor named Vivi, and they drove each other completely <laughs> crazy. And I, I was just writing into the play because I thought it so funny, honestly. And so it was this strange thing where I got to scene nine, which is the, the Skype scene. It was originally a phone call scene, it's now a Skype scene. And I realized I had built this whole thing with this woman across the hall, and what was it for? And it was a moment in the play where something needed to really shift. And so that, that happens to me a lot when I'm writing, that you know, there are things that seem like they must have been mapped out intentionally, but actually it was a surprise to me. But once I, once I found that you know, it was sort of there for me, it was, I had already written myself there. Is that what you mean by the ending, or are you talking about just yes, the no, last few lines? that's exactly what I'm... Well, I want to thank you for letting us spend the afternoon with Vera and Leo. The characters are wonderful. Particularly the, the quality of the voices just felt so right to me. And uh, so I have a question for Amy. As far as, as far as the right, I had a grandmother who started to forget her words. Did you struggle with keeping Vera's character lively enough and coherent enough uh, so that, because uh, uh, in the case of my grandmother, she was nowhere near as articulate, so I just wondered if that was a struggle in the playwright. Uh, yes, it was. That was something I was constantly balancing to really render her struggle at the same time that she has this kind of force of intellect. So for me, it was just about really choosing the moments where she loses the words. And you know, I think what you saw in the performance was that even though that it's a constant battle and a constant frustration, there's this kind, there's this fight through it and this through line. Um, so that you're really getting action, um, despite you know the loss of words. So, yeah, but it was something I thought about a lot, and I sort of had to choose the moment in my grandmother's decline, um, which was precisely the right moment where it was both 
difficult and still very possible to, to articulate yourself. Do you want to talk about playing that? That's really hard, right? Oh. <laughs> Oh, let me tell you hard, <laughs> because I haven't done a play for a while. I was retired for Pete's sakes. I didn't. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was difficult to learn, not only because I'm ancient now myself, but because um, the way I don't think the audience knows exactly. That's what I was afraid of, that the audience would think the actress has forgotten how to <laughs> I think there, it, it is established so early on with, uh, what do you call it, uh, that I, I think it, it goes well. Great. Great. There's one. Oh, oh. It does give you a little license, right, if you actually do. I didn't see that happen today, but if you do go up online, then... Uh, yeah, I, I missed one the other night at the end of uh, the play. That woman is, uh, um, she was a pain in the ass, but she was like a magician. That's the way it's written. And the other night, I, I was in New Zealand, I guess. My <laughs> brain was somewhere else. And I said, that woman is really a miracle worker. <laughs> I have to tell you that I once heard it come out, witch. Oh! <laughs> in, during a performance. <laughs> so miracle worker is a pretty good paraphrasing. <laughs> Just a quick question. Obviously, the play was so heartfelt and the character so nuanced and textured. Um, was Leo's relationship with his sister also born of some personal experience? I told you, that's a common question. I, um, my cousin does have a sister who's adopted, and after I wrote this play and found out it was going to be produced, I had them over to lunch so that I could tell them that I'd written this play. And I still remember the moment where I said, and there is a detail that I have invented that I should tell you guys. Which is that in the play you have kissed, and what I remember vividly was them both holding eye contact with me, like not looking at each other for like 20 seconds while they observed that. Um, so uh, it's very loosely based on on the on their relationship, but um, I took a lot of liberties. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And there's one there's another one here. Yes. Two questions all the way over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the end, where Leo goes back to um, Minnesota, is he going back because of Lily? Or does his mother have any impact on that? What do you, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think Lily is what spurs him to sort of face his whole family. Um, that once he actually sees her face and hears her voice, you know, that he starts to feel like he needs to own up to whatever it is he may or may not have done wrong and, um, you know, and, and be an adult about it. Yeah. And I also think, you know, in the beginning when Vera says, you know, you're really not being fair, he's going on this whole thing about she's phobic and she can't fly, and Vera's kind of like, you know, a lot of people don't like that. I think the truth about Jane is um, they both have their frustrations with her, but it's somewhere in the middle, and I. I think that it's time for him to see his mother. Um, yeah, I yeah. felt like I wanted something to happen between Leo and his mother in the play. I don't know if anybody else felt that way, but I just um, my mom I just felt it. a little. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. It's hard for me. <laughs> yeah, well, my mother saw it twice this weekend, and she loved it, absolutely loved it. But I, I did make very clear to her that I was not using her as a model. <laughs> <laughs> I said I have a lot in common with Leo, but I do love and like my mother. So. My poor aunt, who's the loveliest person in the world, and just for the sake of needing some dramatic action, I painted her as this kind of phobic, irritating woman. It's not, it's not true. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised when you said you saw it as a play of, about distance, because I saw it as a play of, it, of generations coming together. And that it has the ability to call into question the stereotypes that old people are going to take away all the resources from the young, and the younger are afraid that they're not going to have any social security. When in fact, 
uh, grandson in need of a place to go doesn't just pop in. He, that they must have had a relationship, as I saw. And I thought that that was wonderful, actually. It made a very uh, powerful statement of how an old woman who forgets things can still be knowledgeable and respond. And a young man who's going to go on with his own life can be concerned, but he, but he does do that as well. And so I thought that was very good. I did, though, have one question about forgetting. Um, when a kid has a backpack and leaves his homework in the backpack and doesn't remember where he put it, uh, no one worries that he's developing dementia. <laughs> but when an older person uh, can't find a word, which eventually may or may not come, but at least can participate in the interaction anyway, people worry immediately that it's the first sign of dementia. So I was curious as to whether or not you were also presenting that, that these relationships would change as your grandmother continued, or as the character continued to age, or whether you were again pointing out that even people who forget things can be good to grand, yeah, grandkids, and grandkids who are not perfect either, uh, can be good, good to people who forget. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I, I, there, there are just many things that you said that um, I felt recognition about. When my grandmother would get so frustrated about, you know, she'd lose her keys or something, I was always like, Grandma, I, I lost my keys yesterday for, you know, I, I couldn't find them, I had to get new keys maybe. I think I thought about that all the time with my grandmother, that everything to her was, uh, you know, not everything, but she could uh, sort of easily go down a spiral of getting really worried and to me she was so related and so sharp and even you know when she lost a word she usually finds like a really strange perfect one in the end um so so i do think there's a lot to that and i think yeah i i think that um you know you were saying around that you mostly play supporting roles and that's that and having seen you do this that, that's that's shocking to me because it's clear to me that you're a leading lady and i think that a lot of <laughs> I think um, sometimes I've heard there's a beautiful New Yorker article about this by Roger Angel or Angel last, a couple of weeks ago that um, old people can, can be it, be seen as invisible and um, uh, for me that was just hard to understand because my grandmother was such a force and such a presence so I think just just trying to render that just the simple idea of rendering the force uh, was what was important to me. So Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? On the aging in the character? <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> 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 oh, can I tell the um, I'm curious, just in terms of, uh, of rehearsing the play to the relationship uh, about forgetfulness and, the sh and how sharp Vera is, um, and sort of Micah's discovering that as, as the play goes on. I'm curious about about your journey with that. Uh, well, I, I have um, two sons who are um, old men now. And um, when they were young, as soon as Sam, my firstborn, could read, I had him reading scripts and viewing me because I've, I've been an actress for a hideously long time. And the other son was not interested in it at all. And I think the older boy is more articulate um, because of it, and because he was as interested in language, and this is important in a, in a play like this, the language she has written is so perfect for these characters. Even if we weren't doing them, I would, hello, I would come to this play and listen to the words. The words are very well crafted and put together, and um, it's a joy to speak to them. questions before continuing on. Yes, I hope. Well, She's coming. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Was, uh, was it intentional, uh, uh, Lily, and you know, uh, because we never really saw Lily, uh, well, uh, we saw her on the computer and her similarity, you know, with the, the girl that uh, Leo picked up that night, you know, was there some kind of similarity between those two? 
Well, there should be something that at least he can see because he does say, you know, he says that she that Amanda reminds him of his sister. But this is actually the first because this is a thrust. This is the first time I've ever seen Lily. Um, usually in a proscenium stage, you know, Micah is looking at the computer and maybe you can sit for a second. But this was the first time I could really see a live Skype call, so that was really exciting. Um, and uh, then the similarity was pretty striking. It was the same actress. But I think I think you can make a lot of different choices. <laughs> I was curious about why you made Vera a step-grandmother rather than a birth-grandmother. Right. Well, um, I think the dramatic reason is how uh, isolated she is becoming as she gets older and loses more and more of her friends and how important the relationships that she has are to maintain. So I think you know the difference between a stepchild and a child as you're getting much older can be a big difference. Obviously, her stepchildren are somewhat devoted to her and they're there, but I think um, that additional distance will make her feel the loss of Leo more. So that's sort of the dramatic reason. My grandmother was my biological grandmother, but the family that I write about was her second husband, Joe's, Kids, so they're my step relatives. So another thing that I did by not giving Vera biological children was to write my family, my lineage, out of the out of the plays. So that was another reason. I'm not quite sure how conscious it was. Um, I'm interested also um, as you're talking about uh, we've sort of ghosted around a little bit the theme of grief and the role of grief in this play um, because it's sort of silently present in every scene from the very beginning between Joe and Micah. Um, and I'm curious to hear uh, from everybody um, about what that role is in this show for you. <laughs> and your name is Micah, how weird is that? My name is Micah. Well, actually when I saw the you know, Zoe was my I had a friend who was in the original New York production and I went and saw it at the Duke in previews and I was in this I'm really tall and I was up in this corner seat that was right next to a pillar and I had like partial view. I was like obstructed <laughs> and I was you know like this and hunched over and I never heard my name used before in like any kind of literature or film or play and so I heard them say Micah and and as the play progressed, and as this, you know, the character became very central to what, what was happening on stage, despite the fact that he wasn't there, I felt like I was this specter, <laughs> sort of like ghostly specter <laughs> in the corner, you know. And I was also ultimately extremely touched and, you know, um, filled with joy by the play. So it was a, sort of a strange experience. Um, but as far as grief goes in this play, yeah, I think, especially because Leo. It's so present because he hasn't allowed it to come to the surface since it happened. He hasn't, I think the same way that happiness is only real when shared, grief is only real when shared. And so he has, you know, since he's been by himself and he has chosen to just tamp it down, it's like everyone else can see it and he is saying it's not there um, until it finally, you know, does. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> um, I like one thing I was interested in was that the they're both grieving in a way, but um, Micah's grief, that's for Micah, <laughs> Leo's grief, it's his first grief, um, first sort of grief of the first order, and it's very acute, and he has none of the tools to deal with it yet. And Vera is dealing with a kind of attenuated grief of the loss of many, many things as she gets older. And she's more of a pro at it. So um, one of the things I was interested in was how do these people grieve in proximity to each other and, and, and what can they mean to each other while they do? Great. Thank you. We have, we have time for a couple more final questions before we wrap up. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she's coming. <coughs> well, relating to the issue of grief, it seems to me, and it wasn't articulated at all, but it's at least that I've noticed, but uh, I felt that Leo had to be uh, feeling a tremendous complication of guilt with the grief. And while that wasn't articulated, it seemed to me that that was complicating his ability to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. 
Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I think that's true, and I think guilt and also that feeling that we all get eventually that things are random and tragedy, can, that we're not protected, we're not safe. I think, you know, watching someone 10 yards in front of him get taken like that, it's just suddenly like, oh, I don't, I'm not necessarily going to live a charmed life when things work out. I think that's a realization that people in the, in the sort of first world that anyway, have relatively late. So I think, um, yes, you know, why me, why not him, and what does this mean about how the rest of my life is going to unfold? Let's Oh, is there a question right here in the front? Oh, as I think back on the many, many... Uh, Could you repeat for with yes. us? Yes, thank you. As I think back on my emotional experience throughout the play, uh, I'm, I'm drawn to the instance of uh, uh, Leo and uh, the lady. <laughs> I can't think of the name. Um, see, it's happening to me. <laughs> Vera, uh, sitting on the couch in the dark, and Leo is relating the story of what happened uh, with Micah. And uh, she, they're sitting apart, and it's very dark, and uh, she is so um, non-speaking, and so I'm thinking she's listening, she's really listening, and I'm a, um, a psychologist and do a lot of therapy, so I thought she's really a good listener. <laughs> and that was such a great scene. And then, then it breaks a little bit of uh, humor where she says she only heard part of it because you can never hear it. I thought that was a great scene. Great. Well, do we have any, do, uh, any of you have any final thoughts before we wrap up our talk for the Well, I, I, speaking to that uh, scene, I, one of the talkbacks, a uh, gentleman said that his interpretation of it was that Vera was just saying, um, not in a comedic way, I wasn't wearing my hearing aid. She was trying to say, uh, I didn't hear that. Don't worry about it. You're safe with me. I didn't hear that Vera was referring to Vera and her line as the comedic part. I was. I was saying my reaction to it and how it came across. No, I don't think Vera was being comical. It surprised me the first time that I got a laugh. I just thought it was, because it was such a somber moment. It took me too, the, the first time we did this production, it really surprised me when I got a laugh. And then I came to really embrace it as not, uh, I think some people just find it incredibly comedic, but I think a lot of people who are laughing was a kind of release. Um, yeah, it's a hell of a story that he, that he recites. And the idea of doing all that in the dark, very calmly, and, and then the audience intakes a breath or lets one out because it is so poignant. And so uh, nobody's ever heard of anybody getting squashed by chickens. I mean, that's a wonderful story, but it isn't funny. And it's just a skill. And well, why did you have her not here? Why did the playwright have Vera not here? Um, you know, that's one of those questions that I'm willing to answer too explicitly. But, um, but I, I say what I saw in this production, and I loved how dark it was in my stage direction. It says, it's actually dark, not, not stage dark. You know, usually when there's a scene in the dark on stage, it's like lit, lit blue and you can see everyone. Um, and they really follow that impression. It's really dark and I found that really thrilling. I don't know if they drove you guys crazy, but, um, but what I felt was, was sort of what you just said, Ben, about, you know, there's a moment in Three Sisters where Andre is uh, going on and on about his misery and his disappointment in life to fierce and the servant and fierce says, I can't hear you. Says, I know. If you could hear me, I wouldn't be saying all this to you. <laughs> so I'll tell you. And I just mentioned Michael's beautiful moment in the dark when you see him putting his head in her mind. So I think there's something um, just to bounce off what you were saying about hearing. Um, about the fact that it is so dark and that it allows us as the audience to really take it in and really hear that story in a way we may not if it had stayed dark or if there was more light than through the window and then as your eyes grow accustomed to the light 
you can really see the silhouette of these two people, uh, family becoming closer in the dark, and that and that final moment where he puts his head in her lap. It's yeah, it's all the more powerful, I think, because you get to really hear that story and not just see it. And you know, there's something about the the description of what's happening. Um, that allows it to be so powerful, and the permission. I think it's fascinating. We've had a couple audience, audience members and talkbacks come back and say, "Oh, I think, oh, I think it's on purpose that she she maybe has her hearing aid in, but is giving him permission to to say, you know, he and there's an understanding that he doesn't want to be questioned about it. It's more about a release, you know, like Mike was saying about putting a smile on and not allowing the grief to come out. It's the final, it's the first moment he gets to." release that grief and share it with Vera, which I think is such a pivotal, pivotal moment in the production. Um, is, there, is there, was there a hand? Thank you all so much. <laughs>